This is the Junin Valley in the Andes Mountains of Peru. I took this picture on a recent trip. I was in Peru because I'm chairman of Sheridex, an agriculture impact company. At Sheridex, we grow high value specialty crops in emerging countries. At the core of what we do is an agriculture phenomenon known as the yield gap. The yield gap is the astonishing difference in bushels per acre when comparing a developed and an emerging country farm. That difference can be factor three, factor five, factor 10, sometimes greater. In one sentence, our business plan at SharedX is to collapse the yield gap by deploying advanced sustainable farming techniques and lifting vast numbers of smallholder farmers out of poverty by sharing those methods with them. Before telling you more, I want to tell you the backstory that led to SharedX in the first place. This is a one hectare farm owned by Francisco, a poor farmer in northern Peru. Twelve years ago, my wife and I began to worry about how our daughters, Lauren and Katie, then 15 and 13, could possibly grow up with a healthy, healthy perspective on their lives, growing up amidst the wealth in Silicon Valley. To their credit, our girls agreed to push themselves beyond their comfort zone by traveling that summer to the base of the pyramid outside the US, in this case, Peru. Within two hours of our arrival in Piura, Peru, we were harvesting cotton on Francisco's farm. You can see our daughters, Lauren and Katie, on the bottom right. I took this picture 12 years ago. Now, Francisco belongs to a cooperative of 100 smallholder farmers. Instantly, we could see that the families lived on the edge, and we could see why their harvest was weak. In addition to helping out with the harvest, we also worked in an orphanage, delivered food to those without, and sort of kind of adopted a family in need. This service trip has become a family addiction for us. We've returned to the exact same place nearly every year since. I was down there last week. When we returned home after that first trip, we decided to help Francisco's cooperative but something more than a charitable contribution, which would offer relief, but not a solution. The obstacle was we didn't know how to diagnose the agronomic problems on those farms. The solution arrived when a friend connected me to an agriculture expert who lives in Peru. His name is Tony Salas. Somebody took this picture of Tony and me the day that we met 12 years ago. I was stunned when Tony told these poor farmers they were growing the wrong crop and growing it the wrong way. With Tony's agronomic skill, the farmers switched to a better crop, grew it the right, right way, and sold it a better way. To this day, I still can't get over the fact that the community's income improved factor four, not 40%. And that opened my eyes to the power of the yield gap. Today, 12 years later, Tony is the CEO of SharedX. I'm the chairman, and he's one of my best friends. This is Tony and me pictured six months ago on one of our farms, SharedX Farms in Peru. Let me brag for a minute about Tony. Born and raised in Peru, as an interesting aside, the four-time tennis champion for the country, I tell him that's no big deal, only two other people competed, so he had a one in three chance going in. Uh, so, but then Tony came to America, earned his master's and PhD in agricultural sciences from North Carolina State, one of our best. His MBA in agribusiness from Purdue University, one of our best. Returned to Peru, became the equivalent of the Undersecretary of Agriculture in charge of ag research and technology for the country. And for the 20 years before he and I co-founded SharedX, was the CEO of what I call a McKinsey-like equivalent for emerging country ag consulting, where Tony and team did over 400 agriculture projects in over 30 countries and a broad range of crops. <clears throat> Let 
Let me describe very briefly our business and impact model at SharedX. We're in business to make money and do good, lifting smallholder farmers out of poverty. We call it our hub and spoke model. We come to a community, we buy a mid-size farm that belongs to us. That's our hub farm. To be clear, we never buy it from smallholder farmers. Smallholder farmers don't own mid-size farms. That's why they're called smallholder farmers. We're the hub, the spokes are the smallholder farmers. When you boil it down, the essence of what we do is we've declared a dual purpose for our hub farm, cash flow for Sharedex, our for-profit company, and a classroom for the smallholder farmers in the community. We're an education company of sorts. I want to come back to the yield gap. This is a tweet from Bill Gates who understands the importance of the yield gap. He calls it crucial. He gives one manifestation in this tweet of the yield gap, a five-fold difference in bushels per acre when comparing American and African corn farmers that replicates in pretty much every crop with a large magnitude. I'll give you a specific example from a farm that we have in Peru growing coffee. These pictures are of the land of an indigenous community that's right next door to one of our farms. On the top left, you can see their effort to grow coffee. I'll give you some numbers. The average yield for this kind of coffee in the Andes Mountains of Peru is eight to 10 bags in a hectare in a year. This is not an average effort. It's a below average effort. <clears throat> this is our farm in the same region. Uh, they're yielding maybe four or five bags per hectare. This farm yields 40 bags per hectare. So we've begun an initiative with, with them with a 20 hectare trial. Basically, the indigenous community makes its money now, its sole source of income, or most of it, from cutting down the trees on their large land and selling the lumber. And uh, we think we can prove to them that our method of farming coffee is more profitable and it's obviously more sustainable. So there's this very odd confluence of 70% figures that happen to land right on smallholder farms around the world. 70% of the world's poor are small farmers. 70% of the world's fresh water is consumed in agriculture. And those same smallholder farmers produce 70% of the world's food at a time when food production needs to rise by 70% to the year 2050 to feed all the mouths. 70, 70, 70, 70, intersecting on smallholder farms globally. OK, uh, Michael asked me to talk about impact trends. I'm going to be really brief about this. Single slide, three points. So <clears throat> the main trend in impact is it's trending. You, you can go to uh, impact conferences globally. You go to any university in this country and beyond, and I've hardly seen any, anything like it before. Uh, the, the magnitude of the interest, the big capital wants to come in, but they can't find the opportunities, and, uh, but the, the demand for figuring out ways to make money and doing good is off scale. Number two. Millennials, there's no going back. If you look at the surveys of millennials, I'll give you two examples. In one survey, 87% of millennials say they would pay more for a product that does good or is manufactured in a way that does good than one that isn't. A Harvard University Institute of Politics asked the following question. In a statistically significant survey of millennials, how many of you consider yourself to be capitalists? I'm glad everybody's sitting down. The answer, 17%. One seven, not seven zero. You can ask yourself a question why, but it's not going back. The millennials aren't going to start saying, well, let's, let's buy the products that do bad, because that's, we, we like that better. There's, there's no reversing. That, that river is not going the other direction. And the final observation that I'll make, this is the main opportunity, in my opinion, in all of impact, reduces to an equation which I call C is greater than I, where C equals the volume of impact capital looking for the best ideas, and I equals the great 
impact business ideas. Capital exceeds the great ideas. And so how about we go to work on I and increase that, right? It's an opportunity for entrepreneurs to come and do their thing. No better place than right here in Silicon Valley. I want to pose a question for you. What makes a person great? Well, it turns out Adam Smith, the Scottish economist, and Martin Luther King, the American minister and activist, had very different answers to that question. Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations in 1776. In it, as you know, he uses the term the invisible hand to describe the magic of the profit motive to do good. Now, Smith had much more to say, but our modern world sees Smith as the guy who said people do the greatest good by focusing only on their own interest. In this paradigm, it is profit that makes people great. Martin Luther King didn't see it quite that way. I'm reminded of his sermon, The Drum Major Instinct, which he delivered two months before his, his assassination. Dr. King was assassinated exactly 50 years ago, last month, in the Reverend King's words. And so Jesus gave us a new norm of greatness. If you want to be important, great. If you want to be recognized, great. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness, still quoting Reverend King in part. The thing that I like about that definition of greatness is it means everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You don't have to know Einstein's theory of relativity to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. I have an alternative interpretation of the invisible hand for your consideration, and that is the mysterious motive force that delivers deep fulfillment to those who serve. Allow me to take us one more time back to the desert of northern Peru. When I returned from my first trip after that first trip to Peru, all those years ago, some of my friends asked me what I had learned. I said that my most remarkable discovery was the average person there is more content than the average person in Silicon Valley. I'm still astonished by the paradox of it. How could those with nothing possibly be more at peace than the 1%? Nevertheless, I remain more convinced of it than ever. Its truth has been confirmed by everyone I know who has participated in similar communities. There, many of us have seen that there's less anxiety about time scarcity, which I suppose is to be expected. On the other hand, I continue to be amazed there's also less anxiety there than ma about material scarcity. How can that be? There's no way to prove this, but here's my hunch. Members of these Peruvian communities aren't living their lives solely to maximize their individual interests. Out of necessity, they need to rely on each other because there is no safety net. And by relying on each other, they live in deep connection. These people invest in relationships, not things. In the weakness, there is strength. And I think there might be a lesson in there for us. And that's the realization there's this other powerful, invisible hand. And this one brings meaning and significance to our lives. In the world attributed to Adam Smith, it's all about business. But in Martin Luther King's world, there's so much more, more for society, but also 
more for those who serve. You see, purpose-driven companies can have more than one purpose. And so, yes, of course, impact companies create social return by lifting people in communities. But impact companies can also serve the purpose of personal return for their participants at depths not possible in the Adam Smith paradigm. And this takes the form of fulfillment, sometimes even joy, that accompany a journey of service. Remember Francisco, the owner of the farm my daughters and I helped harvest all those years ago? This is him. That's Francisco. I took this photo 12 years ago, and I asked Francisco to stand over the day's harvest. What you see is all there was. Over the years, I've devoted quite a bit of thought as to why my family kept wanting to go back year after year after year to Francisco's community. I think it's because, without knowing it, we got more than we gave. We kept getting drawn back in by the other invisible hand, the powerful one, the one that delivers social and personal returns, that one. In so many ways, my family's adventure has been, in a word, great. It's been an honor to speak today. Thank you very much.